Kevin Durant is one of the most dominant basketball players alive, and he's rewarded for it with the NBA's ultimate status symbol, the max contract. Nothing says more about a player than the fact that teams would jump at the chance to pay them as much money as they possibly can. It's a testament to the power that someone like Durant can have on a basketball court. And it's what makes the NBA different from other pro sports leagues. The NFL doesn't have a maximum salary for its players, and neither does Major League Baseball. And that changes everything. The going rates for the best players in the league, that's what sets the market for everything else. That's what shapes how NBA teams are assembled. It's also where things get a little murky. For the upcoming season, Durant's max contract will pay him a salary of $42 million. But KD's max salary is actually less than his former teammate Russell Westbrook's max salary. And Westbrook's max is less than James Harden's max, which is less than Steph Curry's max. All of that technically makes sense in its own looping, convoluted way, which is how the majority of NBA business gets done. What a player gets paid is often a lot more clear than why their deal was structured the way it was or how a team was able to pay them in the first place. When there's an entire financial system System built not just on exceptions, but exceptions to the exceptions, it can leave you wondering, how do NBA contracts actually work? We should probably start by addressing the elephant that Brandon Marshall dragged into the room. Y'all don't even know what the f y'all talking about because y'all talking about the NBA, got, everybody got guaranteed contracts and it's false. They uh, do. It's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. The defining feature of NBA contracts is that they're guaranteed by default. It's not just stars like Durant and Harden who get guaranteed money, but also role players like Joe Harris and Jeff Green, and even Mike James, who didn't even sign with the Nets until the last month of the regular season. According to a Ringer analysis, about 90% of the total money under contract in the NBA right now is either fully guaranteed or under options that are entirely within player control. With so many guaranteed contracts, teams have to get pretty creative to squeeze even more talent onto their rosters. And fortunately, they have options. The NBA has a salary cap that's based on league revenue, but it's a soft salary cap, meaning teams can actually spend above and beyond it in ways that are explicitly allowed by the league. These aren't even loopholes. The entire system is built on the idea that teams should be able to navigate around the cap. How did Anthony Davis become a Laker? How did the Bucks give Giannis Antetokounmpo a $228 million extension? It's all part of the NBA's nesting doll of rules and provisions and sub-provisions that allow teams to keep adding to their rosters even when they're way over the cap. The most notable and the most critical way that teams do that is through what are called bird rights. So much of the wonky salary cap math you see in the NBA starts there because when a player with bird rights hits free agency, their team can go over the salary cap to re-sign them to an even bigger deal than what other teams could offer. Even after one season together, a team can go over the cap to re-sign a player to 120% of their previous salary. If a player goes two years without changing teams as a free agent, their team can re-sign them for even more. And if that player goes three seasons without signing elsewhere, then boom. By the power of Larry Bird, they get to re-up no matter what their team's cap situation looks like, and they get to make bank while they're doing it. This might sound counterintuitive, but bird rights were actually instrumental to the way Kevin Durant came to the Nets. Back in 2019, Durant could have signed with any team he wanted. New York, either the LA teams, Real Madrid, whatever. He chose Brooklyn, but technically he signed his new deal with Golden State using his bird rights so that they could then trade him to Brooklyn. This is what's called a sign-in trade, and it's exactly what it says on the tin. I don't know what I expected. But on the other side of the trade, the Nets actually did the same thing with D'Angelo Russell and his bird rights, which meant sending a talented first-time All-Star to a Warriors team that didn't have the cap space to sign him outright. There's a lot of red tape around what makes a legal NBA trade in the general sense, and trust me, that's a whole other video. But for a deal of this size where both the Warriors and the Nets would both end up over the cap, the incoming and outgoing salary needed to be within 25% of each other, give or take 100 grand. But otherwise, there was nothing to stop Golden State from just piling Russell's $27 million salary on top of an already expensive roster. The spending disparity between NBA teams isn't quite as crazy as what you might find in Major League Baseball, but what the two leagues have in common is that they basically rely on letting the billionaires who run the teams draw the line for themselves. And what could possibly go wrong? The NBA has a luxury tax for teams that dramatically overshoot the cap, where the more a team spends, the more they pay in luxury tax penalties. And the more often they pay the tax, the more likely they are to get stuck with the steeper rates for repeat offenders. That extra kick was actually a direct response to the way LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh built an overnight contender in Miami. It was designed to be a super team buster. But in the end, the only thing that's really holding a team back is what they're willing to pay. 
The only time the league enforces a hard limit on spending is when the team essentially opts into it. Teams that are at least $6 million over the luxury tax line, that threshold is called the luxury tax apron. No one really knows why. They can't do things like receive a player in a sign and trade. They can't use a few of the more common salary cap exceptions, and we'll come back to those. So if a team does add a player through any of those means, they're agreeing not to spend more than the apron. They're agreeing to a temporary hard cap. That was exactly what happened when the Nets and the Warriors pulled off their double sign and trade with KD and D'Angelo Russell in 2019. But those restrictions were lifted once the season ended, and those two franchises found ways to spend more and more and more until they wound up with the two most expensive rosters in the history of the NBA. Before this most recent season, only a handful of teams had ever racked up a luxury tax bill of more than $50 million. This Nets team blew that mark out of the water with a $99 million tax bill, and the Warriors, they went full light years, spending on such a cosmic scale that they wound up paying $116 million on tax alone. Of course, all of that tracks when the current salaries for Curry, Durant, and Harden are among the highest that the sport has ever seen. And because this is the NBA, the math it takes to set those salaries, or any max salaries, is needlessly complicated. Part of the issue is that a max contract is kind of a catch-all term for what's really a multi-tiered system. Players across the board can land a larger max contract by re-signing with their old team instead of joining a new one. But even within that, there are levels. When a player hits free agency with up to six seasons of NBA experience, their max contract starts at 25% of the salary cap. So exhibit A would be Brandon Ingram, who signed a five-year, $158 million deal with the Pelicans last year. That's a max contract. If Ingram had qualified for what's known as the Rose Rule, he would have been able to sign for 30% of the salary cap. But otherwise, that rate is reserved for players who have been in the league for seven to nine years. We'll call that exhibit B, Anthony Davis. He signed a five-year deal worth $190 million. That's also a max contract. And then there's the guys with 10 plus years of NBA experience who are still at the highest levels of the sport. Their salary can start at 35% of the cap. Like exhibit C, Kevin Durant, who got the most he could under a sign-in trade at four years and $164 million. And that too is a max contract. And then coming in from the top rope is exhibit D, AKA the designated veteran rule, AKA the supermax. It can be an extension, it can be a new contract. Either way, it's a massive payday that allows basketball's mega elite to stay with their team while jumping into that 35% bracket ahead of schedule. To even qualify, a player has to have been recently voted MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, or All-NBA. Giannis ran the Triple Crown before signing his extension with the Bucks last December, which made him just the sixth player to cash in on the Supermax so far. Harden is one of the other five, which is how he ended up as Brooklyn's highest paid star, even after teaming up with two other Max players. Well, almost two other Max players. Let's back up a bit. KD, Kyrie, and DeAndre Jordan had dreamed of the day they'd be able to play together in the NBA. But trying to fit that much new salary onto an established roster like Brooklyn's turned out to be quite the logistical challenge. So to make the numbers work, and specifically to make room for Jordan, which, you know, is a choice, the Nets carved out more cap room. First by working out the sign and trade for Durant with Golden State, and then by convincing Irving to convert one million of his annual salary into eight separate performance bonuses worth $125,000 each. Unless you're the player cashing the check or the team governor writing it, a bonus in an NBA contract usually isn't much more than trivia. It's great that Julius Randle pulled in a cool $945,000 for making his first All-Star game, but it didn't really change all that much for the Knicks. The bonuses Irving agreed to were different because they were organized specifically to give the Nets a tiny bit of wiggle room when they really needed it. The key was setting up bonuses that were classified as unlikely because according to the collective bargaining agreement, unlikely bonuses don't actually count directly toward the salary cap. Now, you might be thinking that the NBA would have some incredibly sophisticated projection system for deciding which bonuses are likely and which ones are unlikely. And you would be wrong. It's a lot of nonsense. Because the only thing that decides whether a bonus counts against the cap or not is whether the player would have met the criteria for it the season before. So Irving and the Nets agreed on a series of reasonably attainable benchmarks that fit the bill, and voila! KD gets his max deal, Kyrie gets close enough, DeAndre tags along on a four-year, $40 million contract, and because the Nets cleared a bit more room, they were able to sign their second round pick, Nicholas Claxton, to a longer deal with more guaranteed money. Which seems notable considering that Claxton outplayed Jordan and took a lot of his minutes. 
With Claxton's contract, the difference came from the Nets signing him into their cap space rather than signing him using a cap exception. There are so many ways for teams to work around the cap, and the NBA runs on those exceptions. They let capped out teams sign the rookies they draft, they let winning teams bring back their best players, and they let big spinning super teams fill out their rosters. For a team in Brooklyn's position, they also present the best way forward. This version of the Nets cannot create cap space, and I mean that literally. Just the salaries of Durant, Harden, and Irving alone put the Nets over the cap last season and most likely will next season too. So if the Nets want to sign any new players in free agency, they'll need to use an exception to do it. The most common example is what's called the mid-level exception. And it's every basketball fan's favorite way to explain how their team is going to convince an overqualified free agent to come push them toward a championship. But there's also a separate version of the mid-level exception for teams that pay the luxury tax. It's worth a few million less, and it can be used for contracts that last up to three years instead of four. Then there's an even smaller biannual exception that's available to almost every team, but they can't use it two years in a row, and it can only be used for contracts that last up to two years. And that's just the beginning. Okay, slow down, Hova. Slow down, Hova. I can't, I, he won't stop. It was the minimum salary player exception that allowed the Nets to add Blake Griffin in the middle of the regular season when they were already about $56 million over the cap. Despite what you may have read on social media, Brooklyn didn't break the NBA by adding another former All-Star to its roster. They're saying, no way, you must have rigged something. I didn't do fucking shit. I didn't rig shit. All the Nets really did was use one of the same cap exceptions available to every other team to sign a role player. Okay, maybe a borderline Hall of Fame role player, but in terms of mechanics, the Griffin signing was pretty standard. A crummy team bought a veteran out of his contract so he could pick up with a contender. And Griffin was willing to return $13.3 million to the Pistons for the chance to play anywhere else. The easier and less costly way to get out of a contract early is by negotiating an option into it from the start. All three of Brooklyn's superstars have one. So even though Durant, Harden, and Irving technically have two more seasons left on their deals, they get to decide for themselves whether they're actually coming back for that second season. If James Harden doesn't like the roster moves the Nets are making or how he's getting his touches or what kind of Gatorade they keep stocked in the fridge, he could bolt for another team in 2022. And Brooklyn would still be on the hook to send Houston three more unprotected first round picks and three more pick swaps from trading for him in the first place. That kind of pressure makes it much harder for a team to play it cheap when the bill comes due. Jeff Green, Bruce Brown, and Blake Griffin were crucial to Brooklyn's playoff run, and all three will hit free agency this summer. If the Nets try to save on luxury tax by not even attempting to re-sign them, they could wind up paying a much bigger price with their stars down the line. And the same risk would apply if Brooklyn decides not to use its mid-level exception. This is just part of the reason why teams that stay together get so much more expensive over time. Most of the contracts in the NBA already scale up from year to year. And when those contracts expire, good players on good teams understandably expect a raise. Even a star on a max contract might be eligible for an even bigger max contract. Add it all up and every team is on a ticking clock. There's always another contract that's about to expire, which means there's always a need to keep moving. As soon as a front office is done stacking all these contracts on top of each other in a way that makes sense, they have to start pulling them out, one Jenga block at a time, and hope that the whole thing doesn't collapse. That's the trick when teams are working with this much guaranteed money. NBA rosters are built on basketball talent, but the structure of those rosters, the actual framework, that comes from the contracts themselves and the way they all fit together. 